Good evening, viewers, and welcome this evening to our broadcast. We are very pleased to welcome the Honourable Bernadette Jordan on shortly. And uh, we had a little bit of tef technical difficulty. It always adds to the uh, flair of the evening. But uh, we are here and uh, happy about that. So I want to thank all of you for joining and for getting on. We're just going to use this little bit of time here to build an audience. So I invite you to put hashtag replay if you watch it afterwards, uh, share it. Uh, share it in your news feeds. Uh, however you can help us get the word out, that would be great. So thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to acknowledge uh, some viewers here. If you can put hello in the comments, that even be that would be excellent. I'm just noticing here lots of viewers putting questions in here. We will highlight reasonable and relevant as usual. Our disclosure always has ripple effects as we take no side on any issue. It's just a platform for voice. Um, in fact, I've learned so much about this industry in the past couple of weeks. So I have a lot of thank yous and shout out to uh, give to many people tonight. Um, but yes, we will show reasonable and relevant comments. That's not to say, though, that the minister will be able to address all those. Sometimes the comments and questions do require more context, background information. But feel free, for the sake of transparency, to put any questions or input in the comments. And of course, the minister has a copy of the show afterwards, and uh, that will be reflected. I'm just going to take this quick call from Mike Calloway. <laughs> Mike, Mike, we got it. We're good to go. Wanted to check to see if I can help. Okay, no, we got it. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so yes, we're gonna do that. So I'm I'm really want to get the audience to about a hundred people right now. So I just want to give it a couple more uh seconds here. Uh Matt Brown, hello, hello, Bernie Chasson, hello, Bill McLean. Um Let's see here. I just want to acknowledge some more viewers on here joining us from all over Canada. This is absolutely wonderful. Bill McLean. Josephine Kennedy, Paul Fraser, Brian McLean, Tara Donovan, Florence uh, Sutherland, uh, Surreal, Ter look at that, Surreal, I think I finally pronounced your name right, uh, Leanne Young LeBlanc, um, Lisa McDonald, this is absolutely excellent, you guys, so help us get the audience here up to 100 people, and uh, in about 30 seconds here, we're going to bring on the minister, so thank you very much. Uh, Charlotte McClellan. And Christina Joe. All right. So let's get ready here to kick this off. Um, I just want to say thank you uh, to a lot of people, but right now, I'm going to pull up my notes here because there's a lot of terminology I'm, I've learned along the way for the questions. Here we go. So a federal, this is what kicks off our show this evening. And oh, yes, we are at 96. I want to get it up for more people. Uh, a federal aid package during COVID-19 was released for harvesters on, fr on Friday, the May the 15th, 2020. However, there's many questions that linger. Coincidentally, we already had started collecting footage and data a year ago for our first documentary, Claws and Laws a collaborative collection that also included public awareness with Indigenous harvesters. COVID-19 did stop us in our tracks, though, but we have been able to use this time to continue collecting the collective voice of business owners and how this has impacted them. We traveled the island to 12 ports to collect input. These are real people, families, elderly harvesters, generational history with a story to each boat that heads out and attempts to make a living for the entire year in a matter of eight weeks. One might assume it's a lucrative endeavor, but we feel there is more to the story. Uh, what we can confirm is that there is a lot more detail, expense, and history that makes or breaks someone in this industry. So at 8.15 tonight, we are proud to host, pleased to host the uh, live broadcast with the Honorable Bernadette Jordan, Minister of Fisheries and Oceans and Canadian Coast Guard. And we are going to bring her on now. Thank you so much. Hello, uh, Minister uh, Bernadette. How are, how are you? I'm great. Thank you, Rebecca. That's good. I'm very happy that I can hear you nice and clear. Oh, uh, okay. Wi-Fi, so that's excellent. Well, first of all, I want to thank you very much for giving us uh, your time this evening. And um, I also want to thank, just before we start out here, some names. I want to give a shout out of thanks to MP Mike Calloway and his team for the unwavering support the past eight weeks for coming on our show to provide some accurate source for updates. Uh, thank you to everyone that's been involved in this, which I'll also give more thank yous at the end. 
But let's start off. I would love, I've been looking at your pictures. I've been following you on Facebook. Give us a little bit of history about your background in Nova Scotia. Uh, so, you know, raised here in Nova Scotia, um, my family, immigrant family, came here when I was uh, about 10 years old to Nova Scotia, raised in a, a fishing coastal community. Um, probably that's one of the reasons why I'm as passionate I, as I am about oceans, uh, because I, I I know how important the fishing sector is to the rural economies, their coastal economies. Um, so that, that's uh, where I come from. Um, always had an interest in politics, always had an interest in running, but wanted to wait till, you know, I saw I saw the writing on the wall and said, if I don't do it now, I probably won't. So took the plunge in 2015 and here I am now. Well, and we appreciate that. And the pictures I, I was looking over and you've, you really put a lot of work into traveling around. I, I noticed that you really have a pulse on the people in Nova Scotia. And regrettably with everything that we've been through, you're still maintaining your presence there with the locals. And that's something to uh, be acknowledged for. So let's say, I know your schedule is so tight and I really appreciate that. I'm gonna get right into the questions if that's okay with you. Sure. Okay, so the funding announcement. Your government recently announced $469 million in support for fish harvesters. Can you explain to us how you and your team designed these programs and why you decided to, to deliver the funds in this way? So one of the things we've been very focused on since the very start of COVID-19 was making sure we got uh, money out the door to people as quickly as possible. And once we rolled out things like the, um, the business account and the wage subsidy and the uh, emergency response benefit, we recognized that that because of the unique nature of fishing enterprises, they did not qualify for a lot of the structure, the, a lot of the, the, um, the measures that we put in place. So we had to, to come up with things to address the specific, unique concerns of the fishing industry. We did that by listening to what harvesters had to say. I have to give a big shout out to Mike Calloway here uh, and Jaime Batiste and Kate Breton, who were both very, very strong advocates for the industry, who took a lot of calls, who I, I honestly, Mike Calloway probably texted, called me or emailed me every day uh, to tell me what he was hearing on the ground and how we ha had to help address it. Uh, so those were all things that we had to take into consideration, as well as talking to harvester organizations um, and, and making sure that we, we try to address as many of the concerns that we heard as possible. So, and I, I want to apologize to uh, Minister, if my questions seem repetitive, I have no, had to learn quite a lot. So are you still going to work with the government colleagues to fix the wage subsidy, the CEBA for fish harvesters or EI for seasonal workers? So what we did was when we looked at the um, the SEBA, the, the business account, it did not work for harvesters, um, you know, because of many are intergenerational, because of uh, the fact that they're structured so that they're, um, they're paying shares as opposed to wages. We felt it was easier and quicker and more beneficial for us to actually develop a program that's specifically geared towards harvesters. So that was what we did. It was, um, we felt that the sector specific support was critical to the industry, critical to the harvesters. And we wanted to make sure that we, we, we fixed the, 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 the challenges that they had for a very niche group of people. And I think that we, um, we managed to do that very successfully with the measures that we announced last week. And there's likely, I've noticed you've said a lot of times repeatedly in conversation and in your uh, broadcast that there is daily updates um, that come along with designing these packages. So uh, number three, regarding EI for fishermen, is it based on going fishing this year or is it regardless of whether you fish or not this year? So one of the things we heard, of course, um, loud and clear was the challenges around EI and making sure that because Fisher's EI is structured differently than regular EI, it's, 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 it's not based on the amount of hours you work, it's based on your catch. Um, we wanted to make sure that we addressed that so that if fishers, if harvesters chose not to, um, made a business decision to not fish this year, they were able to still collect their EI based on their last season's earnings. So that is, that's what we did. Um, it's not rolled out yet. We're still working on the, the technical pieces of that, but fishers can rest assured knowing that, that that decision has been made, that they will be able to collect their EI based on the, um, the season, the previous seasons. So that likely answers question number four. There's a lot of technical things you just mentioned are involved with this. And I did get a lot of technical questions sent in, which I had to always respond. It did sound technical, but 
the the captain and the shares person are able to receive EI based on the previous year's EI. But does that apply to the crew? I know a lot of fishermen are really concerned that their crew, their deckhand is covered. Are the crew are paid different than the share person crew received a set wage per week? They get paid regardless of how much lobster is landed. Right. So when it comes to EI with regards to um, the crew or plant workers, because we've heard this a lot as well, seasonal industries have have definitely been challenged this year with COVID-19. Um, we recognize that there is more that needs to be done in terms of making sure that those people continue to get paid. Uh, they're part of a bigger picture. It's it's not going to be strictly just um, our fishers or the, the plant workers, the people who work on the boats. This is going to impact our hospitality industry. It's going to impact our tourism sector, our agriculture sector. We know that those are big, big pieces of the puzzle that we do have to address. Already having conversations with those, uh, with regards to um, how we deal with the EI going forward for people who are in seasonal industries. As you've said, and as I'll say again, um, you know, this is this is like a, it's like a moving target. We're, we're constantly adapting and changing programs to make sure that we're addressing the most needs as they come forward. I've already had conversations with the mm -hmm. minister for ESDC uh, with regards to the EI piece and the, and, and all I can say is, you know, as the prime minister has said, and as I have said many times, we're not going to um, leave anyone behind okay um so i i just got a, a side comment to that uh, owner choose not to fish they would still receive their ei is that for the workers on the boat as well yeah and crystal if you just rewind the video after i i believe the minister just answered that one um uh how is there any consideration being given to subsidizing the price of lobster per pound to help create domestic markets so DFO has, is not a market regulator. It never has been. And I don't think that that's a role that we, we really want to go into. I know in agriculture, they do have um, like the supply management system. That's not available in fisheries. But what we are doing is making sure that when uh, harvesters make business decisions, that we're there to support them in those decisions, uh, making sure that they do have the, the access to the subsidies that we have uh, put in place. It's going to be important. Um, for them to make sure that they have a business plan going forward, um, it, it is a it is a tough thing to do. But we also we also really want people to you know start looking at Canadian seafood. We 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 don't eat enough of it ourselves. Uh, I think we need to definitely market ourselves better in terms of our domestic market um, mm -hmm. and and buy and eat Canadian seafood. I f I fully agree with you there. Um, how soon will the applications be available for the minister's announcement on May the 14th? So right now we're working to get those announcements out the door. We're, we're working on the details of uh, applying. We do know it has to be something that's easy, quick, and, uh, you know, something that can be rolled out very fast. We are working on that now. I think what we would say is that Fishers can rest assured that the money is going to be there for them, that there is going to be relief, um, and that we will we will get it out as soon as we possibly can. And and just some general questions: What are the dominant concerns you've heard from uh, partners in the industry, which have, which you've addressed, and what concerns are you hearing that still require a solution? You know, every day we hear different we hear different uh, challenges. This is this is an unprecedented time. This is something that we um, you know we we've We've never seen anything like it, and we're trying to deal with a lot of the challenges as they as they come forward. Of course, market access is a big one. We've seen, you know, the the decline in in our export markets. Um, we are trying to address that by helping processors. Uh, we've we announced sixty two point five million dollars for them to, you know, maybe uh, retool their facilities so that they can add value added products um, to increase their freezer and refrigeration capacity. Those are all things that are going to help you know with the market situation but we continue to monitor every day what's yeah. happening on the ground what's happening uh and around the world and seeing how we can best address those concerns as we go forward um how are you seeing the industry adapt to this new reality what practices are processors and harvesters changing due to the pandemic you know there's a lot of there's a lot of really innovative uh 
things going on. We we um, we heard about a, an oyster an oyster processing facility, for example, that now wants mm -hmm. to actually re redevelop so that they're developing smoked oysters rather than a fresh product because they can they have a they they can store those easier. They can sell them domestically easier. Um, you know, there's a lot of of people who are looking at better ways to market locally. Uh, when I say locally, I mean domestically. Um, people thinking in terms of, you know, we've all heard the stories and, and some of us have actually lived through when lobster was something that you didn't want to eat because it was, uh, you know, it was poor man's food and we've moved away from that and it's now a very high quality product. But, you know, we know it's also a very good source of protein and that we're going to need to keep this food supply chain open and be able to, to offer high quality uh, protein products right across the country. Now, there was a delay in the first couple of weeks for certain gulfs, uh, certain zones, uh, which I was taking notes on who was fishing and who had been delayed. What measures were put in place to come to those conclusions, if you don't mind answering, uh, Minister? What, what was put in place there to delay that? And is there any compensation for those fishermen that so have lost the two weeks? So that was that was you know these 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 decisions are never easy. Um, they're extremely complex and they're very challenging. Uh, you know we had two areas that wanted to open later because the processing facilities were not ready because of um, you know the protocols they had to put in place for safety. We had one who wanted to go right away. We had another area who wanted to delay by a week. The, the challenge that we have, especially with the Gulf and the four LFAs that are that are there, is that the one thing that they told us was that no matter what the date was, they all go together. That mm -hmm. has historically been the way that the Gulf fishery has opened. Um, that way, no one has an advantage over anyone else. So because of the health and safety concerns we heard from many, many people, um, we did delay the season to the 15th. And I know it was a struggle for a lot of people. Um, and But, you know, I mean, it was something that we, we unfortunately had to do. It's 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 not a it's not an easy decision. It was uh, not something that I took lightly, but it is something that I felt that for the health and safety of the workers in in the processing facilities, it had to be done that way. Um, with regards to what's going to happen in terms of compensation for those people, I mean, we do have the you know the the new fisheries grant that's available. That's ten thousand um, dollars. Whether or not there will be an extension on the season will depend on conservation. Uh, what the season looks like at that time. Um, all of those things will be driven by science and those decisions will be made at a later date. Th thank you, Minister. I also, um, the price, I noticed that the price is different in different areas. So uh, down on one part of Cape Breton, the, the lobster fishermen are getting $4 a pound. Now you did mention you don't regulate that. So that probably answers my question. Is there any monitors in place to make sure that the, the lobster fishermen are getting a fair price across the board? We don't, we don't, um, we do not as DFO regulate the, the price. Um, I know that in some places, I believe PEI actually does. They, their, their fisheries minister has put a price on, um, that they've all agreed to, but here in Nova Scotia, that is not, uh, that's not the, the practice. The market de determines the price. Mm -hmm. And it, we also have some that are new entrants. Will, will any of this apply to new entrants this year since they don't have a foundation for last year to, be, to build off of? So one of the things that we knew was when we put these measures in place that they would not capture everybody. Um, you know, we often think in, in times like this when we need to do something very quickly, it's better to get it out as quickly as we can and, and try and attract, try and catch as many people as we can with those measures and then address the challenges that we're facing. One of the things we are hearing are the new entrants are going to struggle with um, meeting the qualifications for the for the benefits. Those are things we're, we're looking at now. And as I have said before, and as the prime minister has said, you know, no one's going to be left behind. We're, we're going to try and address every, every concern that we hear. Um, and we are working diligently to make sure that we do address those concerns for people. I believe that's all that I have in my questions. I just want to acknowledge our viewers and make sure I know we've had a lot of help uh, the last couple of weeks from so many people. Um, so I just want to acknowledge some viewers, Crystal Dumphy, Colleen Burns, does wage subsidy apply for fishermen's crew that get a regular wage? I believe she answered that, Colleen, if you just rewind the video afterwards. Um, let's see. Uh, I think that's all I'm seeing in terms of questions. We have about three minutes left of yours with with the Honourable Minister. So if there's anything that you'd like to put in the comments, please feel free to do so. Um, is there any closing words, um, 
uh, honorable I, minister would like to say? You know, I, I would just like to say thank you to all of the people who reached out to, um, you know, voice their concerns to, to help us make sure that when we we addressed the the, the concerns that they had, that we got it right. Um, we know that this has been an extremely challenging time, not only for our fish and seafood sector, but for people right across the country. Uh, you know, this is this is unprecedented and challenging times, and I think that the best way that we're going to get through this is if we listen to each other and we try and address those concerns. So I just want to say thank you to all of the people who reached out, uh, whether it was to my office, to Mike Calloway, to Jaime Batiste, to the MPs that represent them, because I know you've got people watching from other areas, um, mm -hmm. that they all get funneled back to me. They're, they're, uh, they're amazing advocates for the harvesters. And I just want to say thank you so much for, for all of the respectful conversations that we've had over the last few weeks. And I'm actually getting a lot of gratitude uh, thank yous in the comments as well. Um, so thank you, viewers. Jason Conrad, Colleen Burns, I'm seeing your comments. Warren, uh, can new business apply for these programs? I believe she answered that as well. Warren, if you're coming on a little bit late, just rewind it afterwards. Um, Mandy Simmons, I, your question about CERB is only four months. She also addressed that, that there will be new additional updates as we go. Um, can you explain the measure you put in place about if your income is down 75% as ours is and the catch is down? Is that a question that you understand? Minister? So I, yeah, I think what that question is with regards to the, um, you have to show a, a, a decrease in your income of 20 or of your catch or your income by 25%. Um, yeah. That'll be on an attestation. So I, I think pretty much everyone will you know, say that they've seen an inc they've seen that decrease uh, mm -hmm. in order to be eligible for the ten thousand dollar grant. Um, those are all things that we are working out. But you know, right now we're we we know that people are this is this is not going to be like a previous season that we've seen. Um, so we're trying to make it as simple as possible for people to be able to access this money. Well, I want to thank you again very much for giving us your time this evening. We really appreciate it. Now, we went a, a little bit of work, and you don't have to stay on. We brought, I saw a picture of you and your mother from Scotland. Your mother's oh. from Scotland. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so we have a gentleman who's world renowned, and he's going to play a lament for Nova Scotia and also a tribute to say thank you to you um, for coming on. And he stayed up till midnight. He's in Scotland, and uh, he's going to end the show. Uh, and this is Paul Anderson from scotland thank you paul <laughs> well, that, nice to see you <laughs> what part of scotland are you in and um, then the northeast so aberdeenshire oh so, Aberdeen. uh, okay. our big fishing port would be peterhead right my mother lives in largs oh other side of the country but um nice <laughs> <laughs> so once again, I, I want to say thank you to the Honorable Bernadette Jordan. I want to say thank you to all our viewers. And just before you play that uh, tune, I just want to give a shout out of thanks to these people. Um, Mike, of course, Calloway and his team, Jaime uh, Batiste and his team, uh, Cecil Clark, Alan, McCa Alan McMaster, uh, MLA and in Inverness, Brenda Chisholm Beaton, also the Fishing Associations, Nancy Wadden, Ruth Innes, Kevin Squires, Michael Beaton, Rob Courtney, uh, MFU, NOS, and CBFH Associations, Aboriginal Affairs, uh, Chief Rod Gugu, Stephen Gugu, and also the harvesters, all the families that let us poke our nose down at the wharves uh, the last couple of days and the last few weeks, Charlotte McClellan, Benelda McCaskill, Dwayne Boudreau, Chandra Gavin, Darlene Sutherland, Luke uh, McDonald, Luke Sutherland, Lisa Grover, Carla Sampson, and Surreal Dix. I want to say thank you, and I'm really sorry if I missed anyone. And Paul Anderson, could you conclude and let us know about the tune you're about to play now? Thank you again, Minister, for coming on. Thank you for having me. Okay, the, the, the piece is called The Lament for King George V, which was written by a man called Donald Riddle, who came from Inverness. He, he was a, a piper in the Lovett Scouts, which was a, is a, a Highland regiment that don't exist anymore. Um, but he, he, he played the pipes at George's funeral. Um, but I, I felt that it had a, a, a nice, thoughtful feel. It's a powerful bit of music, and it brings the traditions of the fiddle and the bagpipes together. So that's that's really why I chose it. And it's one of my favorite tunes at the moment. So the lament for King George V. <laughs>
Thank you so much. You can go Thank to bed you. now, Paul. <laughs> yeah, <very much. laughs> nice to Thank see you. you. Thank Have you so day. much, everyone, for joining us. This this broadcast is officially over. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you. <sighs> Phew. That's it. <laughs>